Before watching this video, be sure to watch the previous video on this playlist where we develop the idea of a confidence interval. In this video, we will go over how to derive a confidence interval estimate for the mean of a population where the population standard deviation is known. This is sometimes known as a one-sample z-interval. Although it is unrealistic to assume that we know the population standard deviation, this assumption makes the basic derivation easier, which is why we study z-intervals as our introduction to confidence intervals. After studying this video, you should be able to calculate one sample Z intervals, uh, Z confidence intervals for a mean, uh, as in homework set uh, four, problem four. We find the upper limit on the standard normal uh, uh, by standardizing the upper limit on the distribution of X bar values. And we find that, of course, is z sub alpha over 2, which is inverse norm of 1 minus alpha over 2, or in other words, um, yeah, inverse norm of 1 minus alpha over 2, uh, 0, 1. And that, of course, is the z-score of that, which is mu plus e minus mu over sigma of the x bars, which is just e over sigma of x's. The notation here, z sub alpha over 2, is used to indicate that there's a probability of alpha over 2 to the right of z alpha sub alpha over 2. This is the z value, uh, or z score, or x value from a standard normal distribution where the unshaded area under the PDF curve to the right of z alpha over 2 is, of course, uh, alpha over 2. Remember that on the TI calculator, we have uh, to put in the, the probability to the left, so we do that as an inverse norm of 1 minus alpha over 2. An e easier way to do that actually is to, um, to get the 1 minus alpha over 2 is just 1 plus the confidence level over 2. So if we're given the confidence level, just uh, add 1, replace the 0 point by 1 point, and then divide by 2. And that's going to give us the, uh, the thing that we want to put into our inverse norm. And as we derived in our last video, this, uh, this gives us the E divided by the sigma of the X bars. The sigma of the X bars there is the, um, the, dis the standard deviation of the X bar values, sometimes known as the standard error of the mean. Of course, the sigma of the x bars is the sigma of the x's divided by square root of n, which we remember from our sampling distributions. So this z alpha is this inverse norm. It's also e over this sigma of x over square root of n. Solving for e, we get e equals sigma sub x divided by square root of n times the inverse norm of 1 plus confidence level over 2, uh, 0 mean standard deviation 1. So the formula in the box here, Right here, this formula is um, the relationship among all the variables. Notice that this sigma sub x is the standard deviation of the individuals. That is assumed to be known and is given. So there's really three variables. You've got the confidence level, the sample size, and the margin of error. If we know any of two of those, we can plug in and solve for the third one. This particular version of the formula is solved for E to find the margin error if we know the population standard deviation, the sample size n, and the confidence level, which I just called CL. So if you plug all those numbers in, you will find the margin of error E, and that's set up exactly how we need to do it to find a confidence interval. So we will continue using the following example from our earlier slides to illustration how to construct this confidence interval. So remember that we were looking at the weight of all 7th grade boys and we wanted to find the average weight or mean weight of all 7th grade boys in the United States. Remember it's impossible to measure all of them so what we do is instead measure the weights of a sample of size n, in this case n equals 36 boys, and we find the mean weight of the sample which was x bar is 100 pounds. Remember this was hypothetical data. So we know that the best point estimator the mean weight of all 7th grade boys in the U.S is the sample mean of 100 pounds. Furthermore, suppose that we know that from history that the standard deviation in weights of all seventh grade boys is sigma equals 12 pounds, that's sigma of the x's. 
So here's what we know so far. We know the sigma of x is 12, x bar is 100, n equals 36. Okay, so we record the known standard deviation. We collect data and measure the sample mean, which is how we got the x bar, and the sample size of 36. Now we establish a level of confidence, 1 minus alpha is our confidence level, CL, which is 0.95 or 95%. So that makes alpha 0.05, alpha over 2, 0.025, and 1 minus alpha over 2, or 1 plus confidence level divided by 2, is uh, 0.975. Uh, the 0.975 in particular is important, and the easiest way to find that is to take the 1.95 and divide by 2. Okay, but either way, that's 1 plus confidence level and then divide by 2, or take alpha over 2 and then do 1 minus that. So anyway, we get this formula right here. We plug in the 0.975 there. Uh, we plug in the sigma of the x's is 12, we put in 36 for n, and work all that out on a calculator, which you can see done over here. So that's just 12 divided by square root of 36 times inverse norm of 0.975. Uh, it could be comma 0, comma 1, but if we leave that out, it assumes 0, 1. I stored that as e, so there's our margin of error, 3.9199279. And then the confidence level then goes the mean minus that up to the mean plus that, mean being the sample mean. So we do 100 plus E for the upper part, 103.919928. And we do the mean of 100 minus the E, and we get 96.08007203. Let's round off to about two places. So that goes from about 96.08 to 103.92. Um, if we really want to be sure we capture at least at least 95%, you could always round the upper one up and the lower one down. But most problems, unless it says to do that specifically, we'll just round off as normal and it'll be close enough for our purposes. So the blue interval below is this confidence interval. The 95% confidence interval for mu in our example is goes from x bar minus e to x bar plus e. That goes from 96.08 to 103.92. So that's about 96.1 here to 103.9, which is about here. And it's this blue interval here centered on 100. Now, we in an earlier video, we said suppose we actually knew that the true population mean was 101 and we have a distribution here of what the sample mean should be. And every time we do this, we're going to get a different sample mean, but we'll get intervals of that same width. In this case, the sample mean of 100 misses the population mean of 101 by only one unit, but the confidence interval from 96.08 to 103.96 does include that, uh, that population mean. It is inside there. Now, if we were to reproduce this process over and over and over again, we would get different sample means and thus different intervals. They would all have the same width. Be sure that you don't misunderstand. The, the population mean is fixed. It's out there. It's not changing. What's changing, if we do this over and over again, is the confidence intervals. If we take sample size of 36 and we keep it 95% confidence level, these intervals will all have the same width. Now, 95% is 19 twentieths, so that means 19 times out of every 20, on average, we should expect our confidence interval to actually contain the true mean. So I've illustrated 20 confidence intervals here with one of them missing. So one out of 20, on average, you'll get one that misses. And this red one here is too high. Notice that the true mean misses it all together. But all the blue ones, the true mean is in there somewhere, even though those confidence intervals are moving around. Now, if you actually did 20, there's no guarantee that 1 would miss and 19 would hit. That's It's random. okay? But on average, 1 out of 20 would miss. That's 5%. And 95% of the time, it would contain the true mean. Once again, note that the population mean mu is fixed. It's not that we have a confidence interval, there's a 95% chance that a variable mean is in it. It is that we have a fixed population mean, and when we repeat this process of finding the variable confidence intervals, on average, 95% of them will include the true mean. 
So we have three variables here, the confidence level, the margin of error, and the sample size. Now what do we want? We want a high level of confidence. We'd like to be 95% true percent uh, sure that our confidence interval is going to change the mean, or even higher. We'd like a high confidence level. We'd like our margin of error to be small. We'd like that interval to be small. Say we want uh, our, our, our uh, be able to estimate, say, within just a few units, so to be very small, low margin of error. And we'd like a low sample size because it costs money and time to go out and make larger and larger samples. Unfortunately, these things kind of work against each other. So there's a three-way tug-of-war among the confidence level, the margin of error, and the sample size. The formula at the bottom relates these three things. Now remember, sigma is expected to be given. We're always using a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, so we can use a standard normal. But we have a confidence level here, a sample size n, and e. If we fix, if we fix n, then the uh, higher we make the confidence level, the lower we make the margin of error. On the other hand, if we make the margin of uh, error low, then it forces our confidence level down or our sample size up. So we have this three-way tug of war going on. We want a high confidence level, a low margin of error, and a low sample size, but they work against each other. For example, if we fix a sample size, then increasing to a higher confidence level results in producing a higher margin of error. Lowering the margin of error decreases the confidence level. If we fix a confidence level, then decreasing to a lower margin of error requires a larger sample size. If we want to decre decrease the sample size, then the margin of error increases. If we fix a margin of error, then increasing to a higher confidence level requires a larger sample size. And if we want to decrease the sample size, then the confidence level decreases. So once again, we got this little three-way tug of war going on. And so we have to balance this to avoid extremes. So we can get a very high confidence level, but this might require an unreasonably large margin of error. For a ridiculous extreme, we could be 100% confident to capture the mean if we take an infinitely big margin of error. But this is useless. Or for example, in our, I can tell you I'm 100% confident that the average weight of 7th grade boys is somewhere between 0 pounds and 2,000 pounds. I'm pretty sure that's true. 100% sure it's true, but it's not very useful, so that's too big of a margin of error. On the other hand, we can get a very low margin of error, but this might require an unreasonably low confidence level. For example, we might have a margin of error of only 0.001%, but this might require us to have a confidence level of something really useless, like say 5%. Again, useless. We have to get a balance. So we want to keep the sample size low to keep the time and cost of the study down. However, what we typically do is first establish a reasonable level of confidence, usual suspects, 90%, 95%, or 99%, and a reasonably low margin of error. And then using those two things, we compute the sample size, the minimum one, needed to go along with our choices for the confidence level and the margin of error. So what we do is we take this formula, uh, E equals Z sub alpha over 2 times sigma sub x square root of N and solve for, solve for N. So anyway, we solve this video, I mean this, uh, this formula for N and by multiplying both sides by square root of N and dividing by E, and then uh, taking the, then squaring both sides, of course, the z sub alpha over, over 2 is better known as inverse norm of 1 plus confidence level over 2. And so this gives us a, for, a formula here that is solved for the sample size. And we can use this to compute the sample size. We'll actually do that in the next video to uh, do this. So in a similar way, we can also solve for, uh, see what's left, for the confidence level if we want. And uh, here are all the various versions of the form. The confidence level, which is 1 minus alpha, is the normal CDF of x bar minus e to x bar plus e with the given x bar, the sigma of the x's, and square root of n. This will definitely give us the 
the uh, the the confidence level if we know if we know the other parts. Okay, and the margin of error e is sigma of x is divided by the square root of n of inverse times inverse norm one plus confidence level over two zero one. That's the main formula the way we saw it before. That's the form we needed to compute the confidence interval, and then n is the given by this formula, inverse norm of 1 plus confidence level over 2, 0, 1, sigma of x is divided by e, and then square it, we always round n up so that we get a whole number that's large enough. And so we'll use this last version to find the, uh, find the needed sample size, but we use the middle version to do the confidence interval.